Coming up on this week's show, how to beef up your Amiga with a Raspberry Pi. House of the Dead is back. And we get the inside story on the latest 8-bit platform, the Mega 65. The Retro Owl Podcast is brought to you each week with our incredible mates at Bitmap Books. Now, if you get a second, go onto their website, bitmapbooks.co.uk, and check out the games that weren't. Their biggest and most ambitious book to date, detailing four decades and more than 80 games that never made it to market. Definitely check that out and lots more as well on their website at bitmapbooks.co.uk. Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast episode number 273, your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. Me, Ravi Abbott. And me, Joe Fox. And it is our favourite time of the week again when we get to let our hair down, chew the fat about everything that's been happening in the world of retro gaming and technology and bring you up to speed over the last seven days. And of course, bring you a special guest on the show as well. And I think it's fair to say, you know, we're getting into summer here in the UK now, the start of the bank holiday weekend. We're starting to get in a bit of a better mood, I think, recently. Well, it's actually rain today and raining. <laughs> no, no, no. Ravi has to bring the bike. No, yeah. it's been raining. Because <laughs> I'm a gardener, raining has got me in a better mood because it's not rained for weeks. So I'm like, come on, yes, I don't have to water any plants. <laughs> and of course, if it is going to be a rainy bank holiday weekend, that just means more time indoors playing retro games. So, you know, everyone's a winner. Now, today we are going to be talking about a system that I've been interested in for, God, about 30 years now since I first read about this in magazines back in the day. And it is something I've had the pleasure of playing with, you know, at various retro computer events and museums. And this is the Commodore 65. Now, there might be people who've read this week's title and they're thinking, you mean the Commodore 64? This is something different, though. You just confused me. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is a, a, a recreation, well, a, a realisation of the yeah. um, Commodore 65 called the Mega 65. I need to say that again. Mega 65. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Got to put your movie trailer voice on for this. Yeah. Um, yeah, because, Joe, this was, um, for people that are not familiar with it, this was going to be a machine that was a really souped up 8-bit computer that was going to be released around 1990, 1991. Commodore put a load of resources into this, and really it was an 8-bit machine that also had a lot of the benefits of, like, the Amiga, you know, really high colour palettes and a lot crammed in there. It would have been the ultimate 8-bit home computer. But then, Mm. just as it was about to be released onto the market, in typical Commodore fashion, it got scrapped. Um, But there were a lot of, like, you know, reviews and stuff in magazines back then. And then when Commodore went under, there were a few of them that made it out onto the market into, you know, clearance sales and that kind of thing. And they got into people's hands. So, but it really is. I mean, it is one of the ultimate collectible home computers. Didn't the last one on eBay go for like 20 grand or something, Ravi? It was like it, a ridiculous it's, it's going price. for mad amounts. There's, there's yeah. a few around and people would be like, oh, I bought this for... 300 pounds or i bought this for 150 dollars and then i like, found it in a car boot in a puddle yeah. <laughs> and and the price they demand is insane but this this realization is absolutely wicked because it's a whole new machine it's like they've injected molded the case it's got a beautiful keyboard mechanical keyboard and it's not just the mega 65 because this is fpga based right so mm. You can run the Amiga on there. You can run the Atari on there as well. And this case just looks absolutely stunning. It has a floppy disk drive. Can you believe this? In 2021, a floppy disk drive that actually reads and is built into the case. You know, for me, that is one of of the most exciting things about this project because I remember reading in magazines about the Commodore 65. And actually, when I first got on the, the internet, I remember coming across a website, you know, probably about 96, 97 showing pictures of the Commodore 65 prototype. And I remember it being like really high-res images. Do you remember having to wait for like two or three minutes for a a JPEG file to download on the web? Um, I was looking at pictures of the... Well, I was going to say I was looking at pictures of the Commodore 65, (laughs) unfortunately. Um, But it was... uh, I remember looking at that thing and my God, that thing looks cool. Because it kind of looks a bit like an Amiga 1200. Yeah, it, it does look really like an Amiga 1200. But then you've got the like little... Commodore key symbols on there as well yeah. and the, the the case has already been built it's injection molded and uh it's got like new features so this software and uh, this hardware is going to last for a long long time uh, you've got you know 
mechanical keyboard, HDMI output, SD card support, Ethernet, extended memory as well. So if you get this, it's like a machine that's going to be an ultimate retro machine. You're going to be able to put loads of different stuff on it or explore the um, C65. Yeah, because I mean, for me, that's, you know, a big part of the excitement is the fact that I'm going to finally be able to own something that, you know, looks like a Commodore 65, feels like one and can run the limited amount of, you know, software that was made for that machine. But also the fact that, like you said, it's a machine that's very forward looking too, you know, with modern features like SD card storage and that kind of thing, you know, programmable FPGA on there. Of course, we did an entire episode about the Spectrum Next. And again, that is, it's a similar kind of thing, really, you know, fans of a certain system or company who want to make the ultimate machine based on those computers that they grew up using. And I'm so interested to talk to this week's guest. Now, we've got Paul Gardner-Steven who's going to be on soon, and he is the originator and and the producer, really, of this project, the Mega 65. He's based in Australia, so I think we got up at half past five in the morning to record this one last week. It was an early one, this one, so it might sound a bit croaky. But um, also, people participating with this project are doing it all over the world. So he's based in Australia. It's being manufactured in Germany. It's Mm. like a true collaborative effort from loads of people and developers and it's it's just beautiful they've got stuff like the actual licensing for the roms as well so it's all fully legal um you know the the software is is fabulous as well as the hardware yeah and paul actually used a a commodore 65 as like his main machine back in the day one of the prototypes so he's going to give us a bit of background on the original c65 and kind of what that machine was like and how they've done it it wasn't finished was it no, no, I mean, yeah, it was something that was about to come to market, but never made it, you know, into full production. So I think that for many people, you know, it's just something that is just fascinating in itself. So we're going to get the story on the Commodore 65 and the new Mega 65 project with Paul gardner Stephen. He's our special guest on the Retro Hour in around 20 minutes from now. Now, there's been lots of retro gaming stories to talk about this week. Let's jump straight in. Joe, I know you're so hyped about this. Whenever we go to retro gaming expos, and if someone turns around and goes, where's Joe gone? You can pretty much guarantee you're going to be glued to House of the Dead. You know what? I knew you were going to go into that story by saying that. Every time. Because <laughs> it is very, very, very true. Um, House of the Dead, yeah, it's been, it's been remade. Um, it's coming to the Switch in 2021. Uh, we've not got a release date yet, but we did have the release trailer last week as part of the Nintendo Indie World Showcase, uh, which was on April 14th. Lots and lots of cool games on there. But yeah, the one that stood out for me was the House of the Dead remake, which just looks absolutely awesome. I don't play my Switch enough. I've only got like three Switch games, but this is definitely going to be on pre-order when it comes out. Um, but yeah, the House of the Dead has got to be probably my favourite arcade shooter of all time. Is it um, going to work with a light gun or is it going to be tapping the screen? Well, or? well that's the thing. I, this is so bad because I'm meant to be such a gamer and stuff. Does Do the actual, the um, what are they even called? Not the nunchucks, what are the Switch controllers called? The Joy-Cons. Yeah, um, the Joy-Cons, there we go. They, 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 do, they, do they let you shoot the screen, the Joy-Cons? Do we know? They do have, yeah, it can work like a, yeah. a Wiimote. You know, so you can play Yeah, yeah. So I, I imagine it's going to work like a Wemo. Like, I can't imagine it wouldn't because they're definitely going to be, you know, missing a trick there. But yeah, there isn't an actual, like, light gun for the uh, for the Switch, is there? So no. I imagine they. There's a thing called a game gun, which just basically looks like a shotgun that you stick oh, really? the Joy Cons into. <laughs> yeah. Which. Uh, oh, well, that would be pretty looks cool. It's pretty interesting. Yeah. I don't but, think I mean, the trigger it, works on anything. You're just kind of oh, holding them in, like, a plastic for, mold, right? Really. Yeah. Yeah, fair enough. I mean, I mean, from the trailer of the game, um, obviously the um, the aiming reticles are on the screen and they look quite static as if they're being controlled by an analog stick. Um, but that, you know, that could just be my imagination. It could work with both, but it'd be really nice if it is a proper shoot the screen experience. I'm sure they, I'm sure they would do that. Yeah, I mean, they've got they've got gyro gyroscopes and in that inside the the other Joy Cons. So you can use them like that, and it. For those games, it feels like everyone wants to play it that way. So it makes sense. Yeah, exactly. So it's, surely it's going to be played that way. But yeah, we, we've not got a release date on it yet. But um, it's Sega haven't really got anything to do with it. Apparently, they just still own the IP. Mm. Um, and this is being produced and put out by Megapixel Studios, um, which I've, I've not heard of them before. But the game does look nice. But what I want them to kind of bear in mind is obviously House of the Dead really is only a half an hour game. Do you know what I mean? So I'm hoping... 
it's not just a remake of the game, just, you know, it's half an hour experience. I'm really, really praying, praying to the retro game gods <laughs> that the original games are on there. It does, it does look you good. Know, as an unlockable. It does look really cool, but I'm hoping there is more to it, you know, on the PC version of like House of Dead 2. There was a lot of like boss rush mode and like, you know, save the survivor modes and stuff like that. So I'm hoping they've got all that kind of stuff in like after you've completed the game rather than just like the one playthrough. That would be a little bit disappointing, but I'm sure they will. They've got to in 2021. You know, because um, this game was so big, though, it's like until you mentioned this to me, I hadn't seen this anywhere. It was actually quite under the radar, this announcement. You know, well, like I say, it was part of the indie, the Nintendo indie announcement. Mm. Um, so th- there hasn't been you know, loads and loads of hype about it. And maybe because it's not coming directly from Sega, that it's just that, you know, the uh, the guys over at, um, what are they called, over at Megapixel Studios have bought the rights to it, you know, to kind of like put it out. So maybe that's why there's not been too much hype about it. Um, but I'll be there day one ready to play it. But the rumour is it is going to come to apparently a reliable source, according to this article on Fandom. Um, it is going to come to PS4, PS5, Xbox One, Xbox Series X. Right. We'll, we'll see. It's not just going to come to the Switch apparently, but... I don't know, that's just a rumour. But apparently House of the Dead 2 remake is also in development, which hasn't been announced at all, but apparently that's also in development, which kind of says to me that they won't put the original House of the Dead 2 as an unlockable on this, but if If, if this crossed, comes out on the PC, on. you can use the uh, Cinder light gun on it, which would be really mm. cool. So That would be really cool, yeah. So, But yeah, more news on that as we find out, but yeah, I'm I'm really excited. In this trailer as well, I mean, it, the trailer looks really good. I mean, the graphics look so sharp. And yeah. um, according to this article as well, the voices have been redone, but they're still in that yeah. kind of cheesy, you know, B-movie kind of style. Yeah, they are a bit wooden still. Nowhere near as wooden or as, you know, cheesy as the original, but they are, they've, it's still got that charm to it. You know, the original kind of script seems to be in place as well, which is nice. But yeah, man, I love House of the Dead, so I pray that they actually do a good job of this. You know, um, it makes sense though as well, especially when you've got, you know, joy cons that you know have the the motion control in there it it kind of baffles me that we haven't had more you know kind of light gun games ported over to platforms like the switch and even you know the wii and stuff before it i think you know i mean there was quite i mean you got the house of the dead collection on Mm. the wii which was was just house of the dead two and three um so we've not actually had a version of house of the dead one since the sega saturn version and the pc version in like 96 97 um you know so this is like 24 years in the making but um I think what it comes down to, what you were saying there, we've not seen a lot of like kind of shooters for the Switch and stuff, is it's just, I think they're just they're short games. Yeah. Do made you know for arcades. I mean? They're made for arcades. I said it a minute ago, they're only half an hour long unless they put like all these kind of extras in and stuff. And I think it's difficult to kind of sit there and try and ask for £40 unless you're me, like, you know, kind of like the super fan. But, you know, I can't see Ravi picking this up at full price. No, with with you know? with uh, limited kind of coins, you know, it's. Yeah. <laughs> it's- a longer game, but um, when you've got a yeah, limited credits, play? I'll be on for about you can two just hours, rinse for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just rinse for it. I mean, that's the only reason I play it at these uh, arcade expos we go to, because I get infinite lives. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I can't I can't see them. You know, I think it's just, it's just not feasible to kind of put these games out all the time and expect them to sell for lots and lots of money. Do you know what I mean? So, but you know, fingers crossed. There are some people in the comments here saying, you know, it'd be nice to see Time Crisis 5 and Virtual Cop mm. 3 and games like that kind of ported over. I mean, they could put them up there for like, you know, 15 quid or something as digital only downloads. And- yeah, digital only download for £15. I'd be all over that, even if they were just to stick, you know, the original House of the Dead, the original Time Crisis and stuff like that. You know, I'm a sucker for stuff like that. I'd pick them up for like eight, ten pounds Do you know what I mean? And then when we're meant to record the podcast, I'm like, where's Joe? Then we'd, we'd know where you'd oh, be, yeah. yeah. Just him. <laughs> <laughs> we know exactly where I'd be. <laughs> Now, something that I've been uh, spending far too much time on over the weekend is uh, souping up my Amiga. Now, you know that I love to um, hack around with old systems and kind of push them to the limits. Usually doing this is quite an expensive process. Now, we've talked before on the podcast about stuff like the, uh, the Warp 1260 and the Vampire. And these are projects that, you know, really push these old Amiga computers from the 80s and early 90s into realms that were just unimaginable. When you're a kid, you know, you can watch. I, I watched my YouTube videos on my Amiga 600 from 1992. When I saw that, I was like, wow, this is crazy. But usually these projects, I mean, I think it's fair to say, and I'm sure you'd agree, Ravi, these are for the real hardcore fans because, I mean, they they often cost upwards of £500 yeah, yeah, to well, get hold of some the, of these. The ones. cheap for some of them, you know, yeah. um, like uh, for the real rich fans as well. But this things that's just come out called the pie storm is absolutely fantastic now we've seen in the bbc 
um, people putting Raspberry Pis in there to act as other processors. And it makes so much sense because the Raspberry Pi, everybody's got one in the drawer. You know, they're really cheap and they've got everything on there. They've got like USB hubs, they've got HDMI interfaces and stuff. So you just need it to kind of talk and connect with the Amiga. And you've you've managed to get hold of one of these uh, devices. It's called the uh, Pi Storm, isn't it? Yeah, so um, like you said, I mean, we've mentioned it on the show before that making custom hardware, you know, stuff like the warp boards and that, you know, they're always going to be pricey because they're made in limited quantities. They're custom designs and, you know, getting those to market. I mean, a lot of these products are selling for, like you said, upwards of 500 pounds, but really they're not making any profit off it. And how just much because is it's this so expensive. one, Dan? This works out uh, at about 11 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> so, hell of a lot cheaper. You do need a Raspberry Pi as well. Now, this is actually a little interface board. So, you open up your Amiga 500. At the moment, it only works with the A500 and the A2000, I believe. It's been tested on. Um, but what you do is you open your Amiga, you find the CPU chip, you pop it out, and then you put this little board into the socket where the CPU was. And then it's got a little slot on the top of this board where you plug in a Raspberry Pi 3. And it attaches to the GPIO pins in there. And then you connect your Raspberry Pi up with an HDMI cable and a keyboard um, and a network cable, put a bit of software onto the SD card on it. And then after that, the Amiga will think that this is a new souped up CPU. It's, so it's not just a CPU as well. It's, yeah. it's a hard drive as well. So uh, you can have a HDF file in there. It's, it's a USB interface. Um, it's also got the the fast memory in there as well, so you can get up to 128 megabyte of fast mem, which is a huge increase. And you can get RTG graphics out of there at 720p. Uh, so that is solving like a load of stuff. Like all of these devices, what if oh, I'd say they'd probably set you back? I don't know about 800 to a grand because you'd have to get a fast memory thing you'd have to get a little rtg kind of um indivision or what one of these other devices so it's it's solving about four or five problems uh with a really yeah. cheap board yeah and it, it, it works really well i mean obviously it's, it's in beta at the moment i mean you know they're still working on it and they've got a really good discord channel um, that I'll link up, you know, along with their website. And you can go on there and they've detailed all the instructions in there. So, I mean, you know, Linux, I, I'm crap at Linux, you know, learning my way around a bash shell and everything. I'm no good at that really. But I could actually follow their instructions one by one and got this working in about 10 minutes. Now, you do need a Raspberry Pi 3A, which is one of the cut down ones with less USB ports on for the board to actually physically fit. Or I've got a 3B model Raspberry Pi, and you can um, get a little riser for the GPIO port so it kind of sits on top of it. And that does work. It doesn't mean that you can't close your Amiga's case if you've got that, because it's a bit too tall with all the towers in there as well. But yeah, I mean, like you said, you know, I've got like, um, I've got a hard disk image on there with, you know, thousands of games. I can launch from WHD Load, um, which is kind of a floppy disk replacement thing. Um, loads of memory on board as well. And it can even run, you know, games that were more demanding back in the day, stuff like Frontier which is all, all seems to be the benchmark that people show in YouTube videos running really smoothly on here. I mean, it kind of puts it up to like Amiga 4000 kind of speeds, which, you know, for, for £11 and a Raspberry Pi that's a couple of years old inside an Amiga 500. Like you said, this, this was unheard of if you didn't spend like thousands of pounds a few years ago. Yeah, yeah, it, it was unheard of last week. You know, <laughs> it's, it's like absolutely mad. And the Amiga becomes the most expensive item now rather than the accelerators or anything like that. But there is another accelerator that's coming out. And I found, I just thought I'd give this one a mention because I found this really interesting. This is by the guys who made the Vampire Accelerator. So the Vampire was a FPGA accelerator based on a kind of chipset that never existed, which was called the 080 chipset. Now, mm. um, for the Amiga, 060 boards and 060 CPUs have uh, had a lot of cards being created and stuff, but they are in limited supply. Like, um, you've got an 060 card, haven't you, Dan? Yeah, but you can't get the chips for them, can you? You, you <laughs> just really can't get them buy. anywhere, yeah. and they're so expensive. There's fake ones on eBay um, because people really want that chip. And, you know, there's I've seen fake ones where people have actually scraped off the... Um, thing and reprinted it on the front and then they have to get checked and stuff it's an absolute nightmare so 
vampire guys are um, creating a new add-on, which is called the Raptor, which is going to be the OAE processor, but for the AGA machines uh, with 128 meg of RAM. And uh, that will be an FPGA-based OAE with a, a CPU. So it's a nice little solution for chips that are kind of going. And they say it will be a low cost, but... Um, we know with their other products, they've been very high cost, and I don't think they'll be able to get it down to 11 quid. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it's going to be more than 11 pounds, I'm pretty certain. But I have seen stuff on the on the Facebook groups and stuff saying that, you know, what is it quite here? Not as cheap as an Amiga 12 and a RAM card, but a lot cheaper than the current Vampire cards. Um, so, I mean, you know, I'm hoping it's going to be around the, you know, 100 to 200 pound kind of mark, which will make it affordable, I think, and for it, and it has people who want to go down that path. The extra features of like the uh, AMMX. I think that's what it's called, um, the extra instructions and stuff that you get with having the O80 processor on board and, you know, you can flash it with your own ROM and uh, stuff like that. It's just it doesn't have HDMI. So interesting to see uh, what the price is on that one. Yeah, because, I mean, these kind of things are very, you know, a lot of people are kind of like, well, why do you want to push these old machines to that kind of limits? So a lot of people just show them running like, you know, Doom or Quake or something, don't they? But I think a, a big part of it is not only the fact that it makes using stuff like WHD Load, where instead of running floppy disks, you can have like, you know, a thousand games on a menu. And I've been loading in things like the um, the talky version of Beneath a Steel Sky and some of these kind of later games that were more demanding that actually run really nicely using this solution. Oh. So I think, you know, th- there are definite reasons for having it, I think. There's one in development called Buffy the Vampire Slayer, yes. which uh, is so fast that um, I actually think uh, with Warp 3D, there's a thing called Wasp 3D, which is just uh, kind of hammers the CPU, you should be able to run, um, I think it's like one or two gigahertz, it's crazy, uh, you should be able to run Power PC stuff on there, um, which is going to bring up a whole new library of games, demos and stuff, so then we will actually have software to play. <laughs> It is cool that people are, you know, developing this stuff and making it more affordable so more people can try it out as well. So, you know, massively into that. Anyway, let's look, let's wake Joe up now. Um, I was going to say, I am here. <laughs> I'm here, but confused. <laughs> it's not, we didn't record that in a separate segment. I am here. I just don't know what they're on about. <laughs> this next one, though, Joe, I'm sure it's going to be right up your alley. Now, this is a game for the Game Boy Color called Doc Cosmos that we're going to be getting this summer. Yeah, so this is coming from uh, Bitmap Soft, um, being developed by a guy called Simon Jameson, um, or Jamson, I think it's Jameson. Um, looks like he's made this game completely on his own, coming out on the Game Boy Color, uh, set for release on the 19th of June 2021. So 10 weeks from now, um, that's four weeks for the pre-order. Um, so pre-orders have gone up at 40 quid, uh, which, you know, I think is quite reasonable for a new Game Boy Color game. Yeah. So I think that's going to probably be quite collectible in a couple of years time. And then six weeks for him to kind of, you know, produce the game and for them, you know, to make it and stuff like that. But, it, you know, it, it looks like a fun little game and, you know, the cartridge, I'm a sucker for like packaging and cartridges and stuff like that. It looks really nice. And this really, game really features nice. a character called Doc who has a time travel device. That sounds a bit familiar. <laughs> yeah <laughs> i didn't think of that actually i didn't even think of that at all um i don't know what the story is behind the game or anything like that but he looks more like he is a doc but he looks like a disgruntled like army general from an 80s film <laughs> in the artwork uh, but it has got that proper game boy kind of like artwork feel to it you know the kind of chibi style with the big head yeah um, and it's got a nice beautiful purple cartridge as well but yeah it, coming out with it's it's interesting because i keep seeing a lot of game boy color games like every month i think every like three or four weeks we talk about a new game boy color game coming out you know when did the game boy color come out it was like 99 or something like that yeah 98 i think yeah so it, it is yeah. weird how there's it's strange how you get that though suddenly you just get interested in a platform don't you then all of yeah. a sudden everyone's doing stuff for it I, i'm assuming yeah, absolutely. that this one works also on the game boy because there's this kind of green screen version of apparently that. not it's, apparently not according to this it says dot cosmos is compatible with the game boy color only they put in big letters here on the website oh, okay yeah i i was about to say that's really interesting you should say that because they have they've got the black and green black and gray like screenshots for it to like as if it's playing in just game boy mode mm. haven't they Abby? yeah yeah and and it looks like it's a bit demade or reduced um f- for just yeah. the game boy but we'll see it, it does look really interesting and i think you're right to have that packaged in 
in a cartridge and, you know, kind of with a manual, stickers. And yeah. uh, it just it looks like a well-presented game, doesn't it? And uh, Exactly. And, and that's how they describe it. They've described it as a professionally developed cart and box that you would expect from any premium product, you know, which which is nice. So, And I think, you know, 40 quid's quite reasonable for essentially something that's probably going to be worth you know how these kind of limited run games go probably worth a lot more than that as soon as it sells out yeah and other stuff's usually a lot more expensive than that as well especially new kind of titles and stuff (laughs) yeah yeah well this is the thing it's like i don't know if you guys have seen but like zavi for example keep putting out like remakes of you know like kind of reproduction carts of like mega man and Mm. they've just done the lion king for the super nintendo and aladdin for the sega mega drive and they're a hundred pounds and I'm like, okay, they're, they're nice packaging. They come in like nice, colourful carts. Like the Lion King's got a golden cartridge and the Aladdin for the Mega Drive's got like a see-through red cartridge. They're £100. If, if I'm like, fanboying over any game, it's Lion King for the Mega Drive. Man, that was a good one. But, <laughs> it's a good but game, I wouldn't pay yeah, 100 quid. It, 100 quid, <laughs> yeah. you, you can get it on eBay for 15 quid, box <laughs> yeah. complete, the original. You know, so for £100, you'd go out and buy a Sega Mega Drive. <laughs> <laughs> and buy and buy, you know, the Lion King and still have fifty quid spare to spare. So I think forty quid for a brand new Game Boy title is quite reasonable. And this does look like, you know, it, it's a a fun platform game by the looks of it. You mm. know, he's got to jump over spikes and water. Apparently, he can't swim. The same. Now that's a long story. Um, you've got to go through <laughs> and you've got to collect these different coloured keys to unlock doors. It looks like a pretty typical platform game, but again, really well presented. Looks like it, you know, from the trailer here, looks like it plays really smooth and a lot of love and attention has gone yeah. into this game so um yeah definitely a good reason to uh dig out the game boy color if you've got one gathering dust you want something yeah, new for it absolutely you know it comes with stickers as well you yeah. know everybody loves it, a good well sticker. it says it says the cover <laughs> cover art's done by our mate simon phipps as well so oh really yeah that's pretty cool oh, there you go nice you know you mentioned that joe um i've got like a, a bookshelf next to me with yeah. a bunch, bunch of games on. My missus came in the other day. She went, you child. I went, what? She goes, why is that covered in stickers like you're eight years old? I said, well, a lot of stuff comes with stickers, so I'll put it on the side. She just started and walked out the room. As, as long as it's my, not my, banana stickers, then. <laughs> it is you know retro I, stickers, actually, which you I might keep, know with. I, I keep buying gaming T-shirts and stuff, like Resident Evil T-shirts, and they come from, like, you know, these uh, independent, like, you know, UK T-shirt makers and stuff like that, and they always put, like, some sweets in with the packaging with you and some stickers. I do not dare stick these stickers anywhere in my house. They're currently <laughs> still on their, you know, so they're not in sticker mode. They're still just, you know, kind of stuck onto the stickers, but stuck to the fridge with a magnet. <laughs> we need to do a retro <laughs> so hour. So that I don't stick them directly onto the fridge. We need a retro so hour sticker me. book. Um, what we day? Do. Can you collect them all? <laughs> I reckon, Joe, it's a bank holiday weekend, right? Tomorrow night when your missus has gone to bed, get, get, get a can of cider down you, get those stickers up on, on something in your room. Re- rebel <laughs> against guys. it. Fight it, Joe. That is it. I'm not, I'm not going to rip out. I'll get into too much trouble. Yeah. <laughs> the last time Joe ever appears on the Retro Hour. Yeah, exactly. That. <laughs> That's right. the last time you hang out with those boys. <laughs> <laughs> Corrupting you and teaching you bad habits. <laughs> Now, there's something else I know you're going to be so hyped for, Joe. Resident Evil. My God, this is your week, isn't it? Resident yeah, Evil 4 in VR. I know. This is my week. This is definitely my week. You can tell who did some of the news stories this week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. Resident Evil 4 in VR. So this comes from um, the 25-year anniversary Resident Evil showcase last week. So we've had 25 years of Resident Evil as of, uh, I think it was April 15th, I think it was. Oh, I could be a few days out there. And, you know, they announced quite a few things. There was like a a longer trailer for the new Resident Evil Village game that's coming out. Obviously, that's not retro. You know, they discussed the new TV show, TV uh, CGI film that's coming to Netflix. And then the new film, new reboot film that's coming to cinema. And then at the end of it, uh, Resident Evil 4, which has been rumoured to be remade for good probably two or three years now. We spoke about it on the show. Was that on the GameCube originally? Yeah, so the original yeah. Resident Evil 4 is for the GameCube, so it came out in 2005, and about two or three years ago, they announced, you know, there was no official announcement, apparently it's being remade, blah, blah, blah. I don't know if this is the actual remake, because this isn't a remake, it's a, it's a re-release. Resident Evil 4 has come out on every single games console under the sun since the GameCube, but yeah, it's coming out to the Oculus Quest 2, mm-hmm. um, and apparently this is the first oculus quest 2 exclusive game it doesn't work on the original oculus quest this is the first one that doesn't work on the first oculus quest according to the article that's you know come out about it we're expecting it in 2021 once again we haven't got a um we haven't got a release date but it is coming this year 
it doesn't look like they've done much with the graphics or anything like that. It just looks like they've got Resident Evil 4, ported it to first person and slapped it on the Oculus. Yeah, it looks like a Wii game or something, doesn't it? it, Exactly. It does look like a GameCube game, Wii game. I'm quite happy with that because Resident Evil 4 is probably one of my favourite games of all time. And I'm glad they haven't like butchered it by completely remaking it and then trying to put it in, in first person. I think they might still remake it in the vein that they did Resident Evil 2 and Resident Evil 3. You know, like a third person shooter, which is what the first Resident Evil 4 was. Um, but yeah, this is something I could see Ravi playing and just like... My, my, know, co- my heart could not take... <laughs> I couldn't take it on I feel, the PS1. <laughs> I, feel, I feel like Ravi would buy this and then invite me over and say, play this, Joe, and then he won't be able to get rid of me. So <laughs> Ravi gets scared playing Pac-Man. Yeah, I, I, this is I've true. never played a quest as well, so if I'm untethered, I might like jump out the window or something. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but this, I mean, I think this is another reason my wife could kill me because of... I don't think I'd be buying a Quest 2 anytime soon. I don't think I've got a PC strong. Have, have any of you guys tried a Quest yet? Not Killer's Quest. Uh, no. No. Because that's the free but... roaming one, isn't it? Yeah, and, I've got and, one of the and, Go's. I've got, you know, the older one. Um, but yeah, not the Quest. And and you know what? That was something I was going to bring up because of it it was also on the same day it was announced that, that um what's it called? Arizona Sunshine, which is a first person first person zombie shooting game on the Quest, uh, which I think was also on PlayStation VR the sequel to that's coming out. And now in that game, you can't walk around in Arizona mm. sunshine. Correct me if I'm wrong, but from the footage I've seen, you can't walk around. You kind of like click at a street and then you appear down that street. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. You don't um, walk. You don't walk. Yeah. You, you move around by kind of picking where you want to go. Whereas the, from, from what I can see in the trailer from resident evil four, you do get to move around and run around and everything yourself. I think um, it's interesting targeting these platforms because when I had a, a vibe, you know, there was very limited on the kind of games that were there. They had like serious Sam VR. Um, mm. There was like Fallout, I think, and a, a few others. Mm. So it's interesting to kind of hit market it just to the um, Quest 2 because I yeah. think it's going to become dominant on that platform. I wondered why they didn't do PSVR, for example. I was quite surprised that it was the Quest. Yeah, and you know what they're saying According to the article, Capcom are saying the reason it's coming to the Oculus Quest 2 is because of it's the only hardware powerful enough to run it. Right. Um, <laughs> this GameCube <laughs> game. This get yeah. This this first person game. This GameCube game they've made first person, uh, which is interesting. But I mean, I reckon you know. I, I mean, I'm sure I've read somewhere there's rumours that there's going to be PS PSVR for the PlayStation Five, so they could be saving it for that. Yeah. You know I, I'm I mean? just so, on the store as well, and they have like uh, a comfort rating system so instead of marking like oh this is the most popular this is the most comfortable so i reckon resident evil What's might be at the two? bottom of that <laughs> <laughs> the brown pants rating i think you need the brown pants rating <laughs> you know what resident evil 4 was the kind of the, the turning point where it was going more towards action yeah um you know i mean in the trailer there's a bit where the the al gigante which is essentially a giant troll um it's how the trailer ends with it about to like punch you in the face and I can imagine playing that in VR, you would flinch. You would be like, oh, kind of thing. So it'd be interesting. It would definitely be interesting. It's the kind of thing I'll probably play when they've got it at an expo somewhere for people to try out for 10 minutes. <laughs> so I remember, <laughs> it's you so know, expensive. There was a Resident Evil game, the one that came out on the 360. I remember playing that. And it was like, because it was all set during the day and it was a least mm. creepy version of Resident mm. Evil I ever played. It just didn't work for me that one. But yeah, th- Resident this Evil does- 5 is, is yeah. like and Resident Evil 6 are good games they're really good games they're really good action multiplayer games but they're not horror games mm. by any means but yeah Resident Evil 4 if you want to get some brown pants and you've got an, Ocul- an Oculus Quest 2 um, I think that could be the way to go five brown pants out of five there you go <laughs> there we go <laughs> Joe's rating now uh, before we get into I guess this week talking about the Mega 65 um, the Evercade now this is Evercade seems to be a title that we talk about so much recently. You know, one of the biggest names in retro gaming systems. Tell us about this then, the Evercade VS. Yeah, so this is a, a basically a home unit. So before we had the Evercade, which was portable, kind of like a Nintendo Switch. And uh, the unique thing about the Evercade was it, it didn't give you tons of games. It gave you a little selection of games and you had them on a cart. You put them in and they'd have stuff like, you know, Namco Classics and... Uh, Atari Classics, Codemasters, Team 17 and stuff like that. Well, this is a home-based unit and uh, it's called the VS uh, because you can put two cartridges uh, into the machine at once, um, letting you select any game from the cartridge and uh, 
through a menu. I'm not quite sure I understand how that actually works, but it looks like a nice machine. It's got um, 1080p output, a Wi-Fi connection as well, so you can um, get updates for the firmware. And um, it's USB controllers, so you can just put any in, and it's got four ports on it as well. A hundred, hundred dollars as well, so not bad. A hundred dollars. When, when are we expecting this? Is it? Is it November? November. Yeah, November. And pre-orders go on up on the end of May. So I've not played an Evercade. So, I mean, it, it's interesting because I've not really been too interested in picking up an Evercade, but for some reason I'd be more interested in picking up one that I can't take about. It's, it's <laughs> one that plugs into your TV. A proper and sit down and, Yeah, sit down and, and play as a console. It, it, interesting, isn't it? That? It's got that little but, yeah. um, top loader as well. Like an old VCR where you lift up the flap and then put, put the remind, two carts it, in. Of the VCR, the Nintendo Ravi, <laughs> the original NES. <laughs> Which was based on the VCR. V- <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you off, I'll let you off. I, I like the look of the controllers. It, it does have a very, it looks like, if to me, it looks like if a Raspberry Pi, you know when people put Raspberry Pis in these little console boxes, and, you know, and they're like the red and white. Yeah. It looks like as if one of them and a Nintendo had a baby. <laughs> mm. That's what it looks like to me. It's very cute. Yeah, it is. It's cute. It is very cute. And, you know, like Ravi says, you've got the four player ports on the front as well, which is cool. And you can use the actual Evercade as, a, as mm. you know, the original Evercade, the handheld one, as a controller as well. So oh, if you cool. haven't got one spare. You know, I think about this, I mean, they're saying here there are, you know, collections on here already, like, you know, the Atari collection, which seems to be on all of these systems. Namco, Codemasters, Team 17. There's about 260 games on there. For the price of this... $99. This makes sense to me. And it kind of seems to be doing what the, the new Atari VCS was touting that it was going to do. And Tommy Tallarico's new Intellivision, which are all systems that cost a lot more than this, trying to get that kind of retro couch gaming experience back. And, you know, we've, we've talked about them before, the fact that we think, you know, for the price, we kind of struggle to realise who they're aiming at and who's going to buy it. But for this, you know, for $99, this kind of feels a bit more like an impulse kind of buy something you get just for a bit of fun because it's not that much money. You know, that, this kind of feels more suited to that market, I think. I'm I'm much more likely to buy something like this than I am the Atari VCS. And yeah. if, if you're like, already yeah. invested in the Evercade world, so if you've already bought all those yeah. carts for the um, handheld unit, I guess they're just going to work straight away on this. And uh, then you can get kind of more use out of them and have them on your TV and stuff. Yeah, I think it, it does make sense. And it, the fact that it's a trusted name, you know, people have got Evercades and they know that they run well. So that's got to give it a lot of kind of uh, credibility, I guess. So um, I was going to say a lot of the YouTubers I'm into have all said nice things yeah. about the Evercade in the past. Just been cheap and not bought one. <laughs> I'm the same as you though, Joe. I'm looking at this thing and actually I probably will, will buy this one. So again, you know, I play my so- Switch. I play my Switch in dock mode all the time. Yeah, I, I, I literally hardly ever play my Switch in, like, when I do play my Switch, I don't play it, you know, on the on the handheld mode. My wife does. She only ever plays it on the handheld mode, interestingly, but that's probably because I'm playing Xbox. <laughs> you weren't the kid that hooked your Game Gear up to the TV with a link cable back in the day, nah, were you? No, I wasn't, unfortunately. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, definitely good to see you. New developments from the Evercade team. We'll link that up and everything else we talked about in our show notes at theretrohour.com. Now, let's take a moment to give a massive thank you to our regular supporters of the Retro Hour podcast, because, I mean, this show, we've been going five and a half years now. Just a reminder, we are an independent podcast. We're not owned by any big media companies or anything like that. Five years, man. God, it's crazy. Can you guys remember the very first kind of episodes? I, I remember Joe on, being scared. I, I was very <laughs> nervous. You know, I think I was on episode four or something like that. And like it was, it it was weird because it wasn't really like kind of like discussed. It was just like, oh, do you want to come on the show? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> now we can't get was, rid of you. Now you can't get rid of me. It was so casual. I mean, we still are super casual. Like like Dan just said, you know, we don't, we're not owned by anybody. We're not part of the BBC or anything like that. But you know, which is really really cool. We do this ourselves, and we we've got complete control over it. And we essentially just get to hang out every week. But the downside of it is the costs of running it all comes out of our own pockets you know until our lovely patreons came along about a year and a half ago yeah which really has made such a big difference to the show i mean we we mentioned it before you know the fact that we now got home studios built Mm -hmm. and ongoing costs doing this every week hosting website costs audio delivery it all adds up but the reason that we can keep doing this show and even when we have events and things that we want to go to getting stationary banners and all that stuff i mean our patrons really help out with all that so thank you so much for your continued support and actually tonight we're recording this 8 p.m on a tuesday evening (laughs) Usually now, you know, this time of day, 
Joe be getting his pajamas on, getting ready to watch a bit of Love Island or something. Thinking and about where Ravi to stick be getting, the stickers. <laughs> Ravi will be getting ready to go meet a lady or something, but not tonight. We're going to hang around for another hour, actually, and do a show just for our patrons this evening. Our second podcast that we do, the Retro Hour After Hours, where we're taking a trip back to the year 2000. So uh, if you want to access that, we've got, it'll be our 10th episode of the Patrons Only Podcast. You can check that out. Join us on our next Patrons Hangout that's coming up soon as well. But really, you're doing it just to keep this show going. And of course, you will get a mention in the Retro Hour Hall of Fame. This week, we want to say a massive thank you to Matt's Bradder, Darren Williams, Larry Turgiancelo, Bjorn Sundberg, and Henrik Clader for good. We all made donations into the running of the show. We massively appreciate that. Thank you so much, guys. And if you'd like to do the same, you'll find that at theretrohour.com. Right then, next, we're going to get the inside story on the latest 8-bit platform, the, go on, Ravi, in your best voice. Mega. <laughs> 65. <laughs> <laughs> next Started the re- strong. <laughs> Started strong and thought Dan would finish it off. <laughs> <laughs> Left you hanging. <laughs> Our special guest, Paul Gardner Stephen, is next on the Retro Hour podcast. You're listening to the Retro Hour podcast, and it is time to welcome on this week's very special guest. Now, we are so excited to um, hear the story and where the development is going on one of the most interesting projects in the world of retro computing at the moment. And this is the Mega 65, which we'll get a lot more into very soon. But really, this is an attempt to um, update and kind of finish the job that Commodore were doing back in the late 80s and early 90s to make the ultimate 8-bit computer, the Commodore 65. So let's welcome on Paul Gardner Stephen, the originator of of the Mega 65 project. Hello, Paul. Hello. Great to have you joining us. Now, um, before we get into this really fascinating project that you're working on, um, the Mega 65, I think, is, you know, one of the most exciting things I've heard about in years, you know, being a kid that read about the Commodore 65 back in the day and really wanted one. I mean, what's kind of your background with computers and where did your journey start? Yeah, so look, I think the first home computer I owned was a VIC-20 because it was all I could kind of afford secondhand in the uh, uh, the 80s. Uh, and then, you know, in primary school, uh, we were lucky enough. I remember when we got Commodore 64s uh, in primary school and kind of learning to uh, to code in basic initially. And then in high school, uh, we had them there as well and learning how to, uh, you know, to uh, start coding in assembly language and kind of going on from there. Then I studied computer science at uh, a university here. Uh, ended up being a systems administrator for well, about 13 years, I reckon, uh, and then an academic. Yeah, so it's kind of, I've been using computing and uh, telecommunications technology really for a, a very long time. And as the Commodore 64 is where I cut my teeth, it kind of has a special place uh, as it does for many of us and other systems do for other folks as well. Uh, and then I was lucky enough in the early 90s when Commodore was liquidated that the German reseller uh, of the 64Net software that I'd written Picked up one of the uh, the Commodore 65 prototypes uh, from the clearance uh, and sent that over, saying, "Hey, Paul, you you might like to to play with this." Uh, and fortunately, it was one of the ones that actually worked. Uh, and so that was kind of my main, uh, you know, workhorse Commodore 64 for a number of years. Was actually this Commodore 65 prototype. So yeah, my journey and the the Commodore 65 journey are, are quite uh, you know intertwined. Were you? Um- like a proper Commodore fanboy back in the days, did you uh, get into arguments about which machine was the best and kind of uh, <laughs> stuff like that? Uh, I, I'm sure I did, but I think it was more sort of early in 90s and kind of, you know, the whole, you know, is the Commodore 64 still any good or have PCs completely displaced it uh, kind of thing? I, I never really had the money to uh, to get an Amiga or anything and I could see that they were kind of different uh, kind of machines. Uh, and so, yeah, I love working on the Commodore 64, but I, I don't think I was too militant uh, it was, it, against folks on other platforms. It was amazing in the UK because they were still selling them really mm. late on and there was still a huge kind of user base for them. Um, what was it like in Australia? Was there, was there still a bit of like people still into them and using them? Yeah. So I reckon they finally went off sale. I reckon I saw the last clearance ones in the uh, department stores here in about 92 but there were already so many of them as well that the uh, you know the scene kind of you know hung on. Uh, so the software that I was talking about, sixty uh, four net, that was being sold. I reckon ninety five to ninety eight, maybe even ninety four to ninety eight. I reckon was when 
that was being sold. So I'd kind of was just starting at uni and even actually the year before, 93, I reckon, must have been when the first sales were. I think uh, it was about 92 in the UK as well. Um, 94, yeah, I think. Yeah, 94, yeah. wow. Yeah. yeah, 94 was the, when the last ones were made, but I think they were mostly focused on the Eastern Europe market. Um, mm. And possibly, and I can't remember the, the order of things, the, uh, the Audi C64s that were dirt cheap in Germany um, might have been at that uh, end time frame and sort of, you know, the, the Franken machines where they had whatever cases were laying around and whatever colored LEDs and whatever main boards and whatever chip combinations. So there were, you know, quite some, you know, <laughs> strange machines that were turned out in those last days as they were really just looking to, you know, to uh, get a bit of cash from their stockpiles. I'm interested in the um, Commodore 64 networking kit that you mentioned as well. What's kind of the background with that then? So that was, <laughs> again, uh, my poverty growing up meant that I could never afford a, a CMD 2000 or one of the, the hard drives or anything, uh, but I could already program on the PC. Uh, and so I remember thinking, well, I've got these PCs, there's parallel port, there's a user port, this is moderately electrically compatible. Uh, so I set about making my own software for doing bulk storage on PCs to be able to you know, load games and things uh, much faster. So... That took a year or two to uh, to turn into what became 64Net. The bulk of the market actually was in Germany. Uh, so we had uh, performance peripherals uh, in Germany were kind of the reseller for that. And I reckon they sold it was several hundred copies of that. It kind of funded me, my way through university uh, in terms of having pocket money for different things. Uh, and basically just used any cheap, boring old uh, PC like an XT or something, use the internal hard drive, a program that ran under DOS, and then a little wedge program on the C64 side. Uh, and then this kind of custom cable uh, that you made up to go between the parallel port and the uh, uh, the user port. And I think the real key to success actually in Germany was that the distributor uh, got Falkriwagen to make a Geos driver for it. Uh, and in a, a funny twist of history, Falker Rehagen is actually working on the Geos support for the Mega 65 uh, quite independently. Uh, I remember when the, the guys at Mega kind of came and said, hey, we, we've got this great guy who can do Geos programming uh, and he's going to help us out. I said, oh, that's great. So who is it? And I'm like, oh, it's Falk Rehagen. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah I know Falk. Uh, so it's, <laughs> it's been a, a little bit funny of sort of, you know, of drawing of things back together uh, with the machine. It's crazy that that led you to get your hands on one of the Commodore 65 prototypes back in the day mm. then. I mean, what? so you got your hands on this machine. I mean, did you kind of know how special it was then? What were you kind of thinking when you got hold of one? No, so I think like for a lot of people in the, the mid-90s, you kind of go like, oh, yeah, it's kind of cool, but it's, it's a cooler version of, uh, you know, an, an out-of-date machine. It would be like, you know, uh, someone turning up with a, a really swanky horse and cart, right? Uh, that had you know some nice new features, or someone you know a, a railway turning up with one of the uh, you know the, the last steam engines with all the streamlining and superchargers and things that they actually put in the uh, the last steam engines, and go well that's kind of really cool as a steam engine or a horse and cart, uh, but really we're interested in motor vehicles, and so it was cool and fun, and I I loved using it, and I loved the advantages it actually had over the um, uh, the original C sixty four, but it wasn't really viewed as that special at the time. How much more powerful was it than the C64? Yeah, so it was about four times faster. So the clock speed was three and a half times, uh, but a number of the instructions were faster. So the two cycle opcodes in, with one byte on the 6502, almost all of those are one cycle uh, on the, uh, the C65's uh, 4510 processor. So that really gave it uh, an extra speed boost for tight loops and things, they would tend to run quite a bit uh, faster. So uh, I remember early on patching a version of Turbo Assembler to do the assembly at three and a half megahertz. Uh, and it was was really lovely to use. Uh, and of course you had to double the RAM, uh, but perhaps otherwise the most, uh, you know, one of the nice things was actually having the RGB monitor. So you could actually read red text on a blue background uh, without it just looking like, uh, you know, uh, rhubarb mush. So it was, just, it was a bunch of little things that added together to make a um, uh, a really you know pleasurable eight uh, bit machine to use. It, it, it was interesting as well because Commodore were kind of researching the um, C sixty five, and you know a lot of people kind of said it was a bit of a dead end with the other machines coming out, and uh, were mm. a bit kind of confused about why they were actually investing time and money into it. Yeah, and I think that that whole story is a bit of a, a sad one. And I think to this day, there are people who worked at Commodore who would rather forget the C65 because it was something that they kind of worked on 
in the design space when really what they wanted to be working on was the AAA Amiga. Uh, but management didn't want to fund something that would be that expensive. It was like, well, just do something that will help, you know, uh, get us a bit more life out of the 8-bit line because that will be really cheap to do. And they, they no. never really bridged the connection between the C64 and the Amiga as well. There was there was that kind of weird yeah. jump and gap, wasn't there? Mm, and I think that the C65 was really designed to address some of that. And certainly, I mean, you had people who'd worked on the AGA Amiga design having input into the C65. And so some aspects of the C65 are actually AGA equivalent. So you had eight bit planes uh, on this, you know, uh, funny eight bit machine, as many as on the, the Amiga 1200. So you could do better pictures than you could on an Amiga 500. Uh, but the whether it was marketing insisting on not having a machine that could compete with the Amiga or not, I'm not sure, but the bit plane design on the C65, unfortunately, was very, very limiting. Uh, so you couldn't do the kind of the uh, the hardware scrolling of a large bit plane uh, that the Amiga could do because the bit planes were fixed at eight kilobyte uh, locations. And so uh, combined with the low clock speed and only 128K of RAM, you couldn't really double buffer. You were really stuck with just stationary uh, kind of images if you wanted to use the bit planes. And so I think uh, that the late date of its uh, design and also the uh, in true Commodore style the extremely slow <laughs> DOS code to use the internal disk drive uh, that you know it, it got about a kilobyte a second uh, in C64 mode uh, from a drive that should be able to do 30 kilobytes a second so you know it, it fitted the Commodore stable very nicely in that regard but uh, you know was uh, quite counterproductive for uh, you know making uh, you know, really impressive demonstrations, particularly when you start trying to display images that might be 64 or 128 kilobytes in size uh, and you sit there, you know, waiting as long as downloading it off a modem at the time. Uh, so, yeah, it was, uh, I think as it was designed, it was unfortunately destined to be a bit of a, a dead end. The fact that you were using a C65 prototype as like your main Commodore 64 for a couple of years, and, you know, I've seen a couple of them in the wild and, you know, at, at computer museums and that kind of thing. They actually look quite finished units. I mean, how close did it mm. come to being ready for the, the shop shelves? Um, I believe they were really close. So the hardware, with exception of a couple of little tweaks on the cases that needed to be fixed because the, uh, the cursor keys were no and return key were no no yeah, notorious for jamming. So I actually had to file my case to make sure that those keys could move uh, reasonably freely. Otherwise, the hardware with the Revision 5 circuit boards were, I believe, effectively finished. And it really was just down to, uh, you know, uh, software tweaks to finish the, um, uh, the basic ROM, uh, which, in fairness, was a long way from finished. Uh, you know, the... the yeah, you know, the bulk of the hard work was there. It was a bit like the Death Star in Return of the Jedi, right? The uh, the, the big guns were there, but there were enough uh, other problems uh, that it really, you know, if you opened the wrong door, you got sucked out into space, so to speak. Uh, and so we've actually got folks at the moment working on fixing all of those problems in the uh, uh, the basic 10 ROM to make it actually pleasant and usable. Uh, and essentially, it's making it a really nice machine to use in that sense. How much C sixty five software was out there, and was there like any <laughs> any homebrew made or anything? Well, not really. At that time, there was just the demo discs from Commodore, which I never, I didn't get any of those with the uh, the unit that I got. It just came bare uh, with a photocopy of the technical specifications document, uh, and I think that even actually only came to me later. Uh, so it really was just a case of trying to figure out how to use the machine without having uh, any real. Uh, documentary support in there. I remember sort of, you know, going into the assembly language monitor and putting in every byte, uh, every different value, and then seeing what the disassembler would show those instructions to be and trying to figure out what uh, the function of those was and getting a bunch of them wrong. <laughs> um, but it was really a blind process to try and figure out uh, how to use the machine. And how did collectors get hold of them then? Because you mentioned it never got released. I mean, how did they get into people's hands? Yeah, so the main way was, I think, through uh, Grapevine buying up the kit that was in the warehouses of Commodore when Commodore went bankrupt. Uh, and then they flogged them off, I think, for $100 US at the time. Uh, they were really cheap. Uh, and I think the you know, my German distributor paid not more than 200 Deutschmark it was at the time still. And, yeah, and, and just... Uh, you know, sent it over because it was a, a quite cheap item at the time. Kind of like selling off a, a bucket of unicorn horns without realising it. 
<laughs> well, they that's the thing. They're massively expensive now. Um, do you actually own your original one? And like, what condition are they in? No. So I sold mine off when I started doing some humanitarian work uh, about 12 years ago. Uh, so I got several thousand pounds equivalent for it. Um, of course, now I could probably get, you know, 10, 20,000 pounds. And really the, the Mega 65 came out of me missing what was just a, a really fun 8-bit machine to use and wanting to, you know, to recreate that at some point. And I'd also had an idea for a long time about an accelerator uh, board for the Commodore 64 using a trick that I'd worked out back in the mid-90s. So in fact, the Mega 65 originally was just going to be an accelerator board, uh, but then sort of morphed into being its own uh, device. And once the Museum of Electronic Games and Art were on board, uh, and we started really planning to make the complete finished hardware like the original um, was sort of, you know, when it really took on that, uh, you know, full life that we're now kind of seeing with it. Well, let's get into the Mega 65 then, because, I mean, like I mentioned in the intro, I mean, it's something I've been keeping an eye on for a, a few years now. And I remember reading first about the Commodore 65, you know, when it was rumoured in magazines and thinking that looks really cool. And it's always been kind of my dream to own one. Again, like many retro collectors, because of the crazy price they go for today, always thought that would be out of my reach. And then when I saw you guys were, you know, doing this project, I was like, I need to get my hands on one of those. <laughs> so tell us about the the origins then of the Mega 65 project and kind of the aims of it and where it's come from then. Yeah. So as I said, it originally started out with me wanting to make a C64 accelerator board uh, back in the, the 90s, because I figured out this kind of funny trick uh, for making a, a consistent um, on-demand right back cache. Um, and But knowing that I didn't kind of have the hardware available at the time and I didn't really have the skills at the time to uh, to make such a thing. And then went through university, uh, learned how to program FPGA chips and went, oh, this is actually a good way to do it, but they're still a bit expensive and uh, didn't have the capacity at the price point uh, to do what I wanted to do. So I just kind of bided my time until about late 2013 when I went, no, you know what? I actually think that they're now good enough that, uh, you know, I could you know, work on that accelerator. So I started kind of doing that and then realized it was actually just as easy to make the whole machine in the FPGA board. Uh, and then, you know, you could have VGA output and all of those other kind of uh, nice things. And yeah, uh, and and the goal quickly, sh sh you know, shifted back to trying to recreate the C sixty five because no one else had kind of recreated one at that point uh, in FPGA. And yeah, it, it was really just because it was fun to do uh, in my own time. Uh, and it was I reckon twenty fifteen when I had it booting up to basic and kind of you know uh, demonstrable. Uh, that was when uh, Mega uh, got interested and thought, hey, this would actually be a great thing to. Uh, do as their next kind of, uh, you know, uh, computer archaeology reconstruction uh, piece uh, as a, a non-profit group. And, yeah, and with the, the great folks from there. So on my own, it would just be an FPGA board that you could stick a, a bitstream on and run. Uh, but with Mega, you know, they went about finding partners who could actually make a custom motherboard for us, make a full custom mechanical keyboard with nice double shot front printed keycaps uh, and, uh, you know, organized doing a, a full uh, custom case design that looks just like the original, but with the correct port uh, cutouts and things and get that injection molded. And so something that began very small and with modest goals has now basically turned into really the, the realization and creation and completion of the C65, uh, but with, uh, you know, some improvements to make the Mega 65 spec uh, with that as well. Well, who's involved then? Because I, I remember meeting someone at Amiga Germany and mm -hmm. um, him talking about the Mega 65. And that was the first time that I'd actually met um, anybody or even heard of the project. And uh, that, mm. I think that was the team member that you mentioned earlier. That's right. So that, that would have been uh, uh, Deft, uh, I'm pretty sure. So there was Deft and a couple of the other guys uh, were there. Um, so I'd say there's probably half a dozen key members, maybe even a little bit more uh, in Germany. Uh, a lot of the activity is kind of based around Frankfurt am Main, uh, so in Hessian, just because it's where they kind of uh, lived. And I also ended up having a, a sabbatical with my work there in Darmstadt, just south of Frankfurt. So we had a, uh, there was a, a great patch for about four months where we were actually all co-located uh, and, you know, could hack away on weekends and, uh, and evenings together, which was, uh, I mean, we worked great as a team remotely, but it was actually really lovely to to have that opportunity to you know uh, to work face to face, 
Uh, and then there's a, a whole you know, host of folks. There's some folks in the UK. There's some other folks here in Australia, uh, folks in the US, and even in South America, actually, uh, contributing to the project uh, in different ways. And one of the nice things, and a decision that we're actually all really super comfortable with is the right decision for this, is that we said from the beginning the Mega 65 would be open source. Uh, we've seen too many retro computing projects die prematurely, partly from lack of goodwill uh, when you do things in a proprietary way, but also just that you know, if the designs aren't open, uh, the support can't go on beyond the point at which it's uh, you know, economically profitable uh, to support. And for us, the Mega 65 was never about being economically sensible, uh, far from it. It was about you know, recreating that joy, that delight, that anticipation of Christmas 1982, of seeing the big fat box under the Christmas tree and knowing that a whole new world is waiting there to be opened up and not to be immediately understood, but to be explored uh, over the coming decade or two or three, four decades uh, to find the, the limitations of the machine. And so for us, actually, the great joy with the Mega 65 now is actually seeing exactly this going on, that almost every developer who has touched it, first they fall in love with the keyboard, and say, you know, I just wish I could type on this all day long. And then the next thing is I haven't had so much fun since the early 80s when the C64 came out of, you know, again, discovering the machine. What can it do? What, can it, what can't it do? What is its personality? Uh, and discovering that it has a, you know, it's like a matured red wine. Uh, the grapes never went away, but you now have something which is much more complicated or rather sophisticated but without losing the original character of the C64 or the C65. Uh, and so that, that makes us super happy. And it's uh, kind of amazing having like people from all around the world that uh, I don't know if you guys have met up before, but um, just being able to communicate over the internet and a technology that wasn't initially there when the um, yeah. C65 was out. That's right. It's you know like this is the time at which a project like this can be done. It couldn't have been done easily, probably even ten years ago. Um, certainly, the FPGAs weren't there. We would have had to have gone you know full custom chip design, and that would have been completely impossible. And yes, yeah, so, so now is kind of this window of opportunity while we're all still young enough to want to do it and have fun, uh, and that remember the eighties uh, and the home computers of that era, uh, together with this you know sort of technological and economic opportunity you know, where it's possible to make something like this. Well, have you been in touch with any of the original C65 designers? Yeah, so we have been with a few. And as I say, the, some of them have been kind of quite, you know, keen and enthusiastic early on. Uh, and then it, it, it's tended to cool off a bit. And my feeling is that it's probably because of this kind of bittersweet place that the C65 holds for them. Because it was at a time where Commodore was being quite dysfunctional. Uh, and where they should have been working on, in all fairness, uh, on the AAA Amiga rather than on, uh, you know, reheating the C64, uh, you know, uh, to get one more hot lunch without having to cook. Uh, and so I, I think there are folks who are quite excited, uh, particularly those who weren't involved in the design uh, are more excited, whereas those who were involved in the C65 design, as I say, their, uh, their interest at least in my experience, uh, isn't as strong. Uh, and, and that's okay. Everyone uh, has their own context. Yeah, I remember I had a drink with them, Paul Lasser, um, mm. in Norway four or five years ago now, who was, you know, one of the main designers on it. And I kind of got that impression as well that he was, he was, he was very proud of what he did, but there was definitely something there, a bit of, like, a, a, bit of a kind of tragedy that it never came out and he put all that work in for kind of no reason in the end. Yeah, and I think that was, again, that added to that kind of bitterness of it that, they were taken mm. away from working on uh, what they thought ought to have been worked on, which again, as I say, was the next generation Amiga, um, and instead kind of put all this effort into a machine that was then cancelled probably weeks before launch because it really was that close to being finished. That Certainly it, it would have been weeks off being announced uh, as being, uh, you know, uh, coming soon kind of thing. Well, developer machines for the Amiga 65 went on sale last summer. I mean, they were pretty expensive, but how did that go and, and who bought them? Yeah, so that was a, a whole interesting kind of thing that we were quite open saying that we needed to price those machines to give us the cash flow as a, uh, you know, a non-profit volunteer exercise to be able to do the remainder of the work. So we, we were very transparent with the community about that. I'm not sure that everyone that saw the information got that messaging, which is a, a little unfortunate. I'm not sure how we could have done it better, but I understand it didn't work perfectly. Um, so some people did kind of grizzle like, you know, because it was a thousand euros effectively per machine. 
um, which is a, a substantial sum. But I think in the first 30 minutes, 60 of the 100 had been ordered uh, and Trends, uh, Trends Electronics, who were doing the selling for us, uh, their website was <laughs> crashed by C64 Afficondos trying to order Mega nice. 65s, um, which was uh, kind of delightful. Uh, and then I think all 100 had been sold out within three days. Uh, and I think it was, you know, within three hours, it was 80 of them. Uh, 24 hours, it was 90. And then it was, you know, the, those last 10 uh, only took another two days to go. So that for us was actually really exciting to see that uh, the demand was there. And what's been really interesting as well is that about a third of the people who bought them are active developers. Uh, and I think this is one of the things that's a little different between the Mega 65 and some of the other retro computing projects is that it is a very developer heavy community. And so there are great things coming out of, you know, it doesn't need a huge community to, to make interesting software and things. Uh, so there's already, you know, there's, uh, you know, Amiga mod music file players available for the, the Mega 65 uh, we've got uh, Shallon uh, 50K, who does his, uh, you know, the, the uh, C64 coding streaming. So he's developing for it now. Has already released uh, one uh, remake of one of his games and is working on uh, another. And did a fantastic Turrican technology demo that looks at least as good as the Amiga, if not better. And so it's a delight for us seeing that it's the personality of the machine. Uh, is very much one of like the C64 in the early 80s of what can people do with it uh, rather than just simply use it. Well, it's awesome to hear that it kind of, you know, sold so quickly and crashed the site. It's like a, a pop yeah. star or something, <laughs> you know, having a, having a big concert and everybody going mad. Um, how close is it then to the original C65? Um, so quite uh, in terms of uh, the... You know, the function of the chipsets and things is, you know, 95, 98% plus, probably even a little bit better. It can use a real three and a half inch floppy drive, uh, which we actually love. We know lots of people are saying, oh, why are you bothering to put a floppy drive in a computer in 2021? And the whole point really is that because we're making a computer from 1991 and we want it to be complete. Uh, and so there's a whole kind of interesting story of us trying to <laughs> source thousands of identical three and a half inch floppy drives uh, in 2020 and 2019 that um, this was a non-trivial exercise the keyboard is also very very close the only difference is that our keyboard is better than the original quite substantially better um, having used the original as i say for a number of years the tactile feel of the full mechanical keyboard made by gmk on the mega 65 and with the nice front printing and top printing it is just a sheer joy to use that. Uh, the main board is all custom, but as I say, with the FPGA, we implement all of the um, uh, the C65 chipset plus 100 megabit Ethernet, dual SD card. Uh, the cartridge port we've changed to be C64 compatible instead of the funny C65 cartridge port that nothing would fit. Uh, the trap door we've changed to be a more FPGA extension board kind of uh, connection rather than the C65's funny custom one. But again, there's very little software that needed any of the C65 specific things that we haven't added support for. So the, the majority of C65 software already runs on it, but that is an extremely small amount of, uh, of software. Um, and then the Mega 65 extensions are designed to be uh, backward trans, uh, you know, transparent when they're not being used uh, and backward compatible to the, um, uh, the C65 and C64 uh, so the C65 itself actually had this kind of way of hiding the new chipset features. And so we've actually used that to also then be able to hide the Mega 65 chipset features. You know, there's a, a door knock poke that you have to, you know, do this knock to turn on the uh, the C65's VIC-3. And then you, there's a different knock that you can do that turns on the Mega 65's VIC-4 uh, chip and the other so kind of supporting chips around that. I do love the look of the machine as well. I mean, you touched on the keyboard there as well, but you're also kind of cloning the the Commodore 65 case as well. Tell us yeah. a bit about that process. Yeah, so that was really interesting. So we we started out with a, um, I think we did a 3D scan of the C65 uh, case. The guys in Germany got hold of uh, one that someone had uh, and scanned that and then you know, used that as the basis to make our own uh, complete design files for that. Uh, and so the first few kind of test units were uh, 3D printed but we, we knew from the outset that we wanted to make this injection molded. Uh, and this was actually uh, a real problem for us to try and figure out how we were going to solve it for a couple of years. And in the end, we threw 
all accepted wisdom out the window and just said, hey, well, this is a, a non-profit project. Let's just ask the community if they would like to pitch in to pay for the injection molding tool. So not doing a Kickstarter style pre-order because then you know the, that would light the fuse and then everyone would be kind of be badgering us and this is all being done in our own time. And if it stopped being fun for us to do, then it just wouldn't ever come to completion and we didn't want that. So we just said, hey, totally transparent here. Uh, we're just asking for people if they want to, uh, to, you know, to gift into the cost of the injection molds, which was uh, 66,000 euros. And so we just basically put that out and lots of people poo-pooed us and said, oh, that will never happen. Um, but in 101 days, which is 65 in hexadecimal, so very auspicious for us, um, we had that full 66,000 uh, euros gifted to the project. And so then we were able to go to Hinsteiner uh, in Austria and get them to start making the injection molding tooling for the case. Um, Trends were also already making the custom main boards. GMK were already making the custom keyboards. And so we've ended up with all of these custom parts that are beautiful and beautiful to use uh, and long lasting all being made uh, you know, in the German speaking continental Europe uh, world. And the result is glorious. And when COVID hit in 2020, we didn't have any supply chain problems uh, because we weren't relying on uh, you know, low cost manufacturer in China or anything because we knew we didn't ever have the volume for it anyway. Uh, and so our labor of love kind of approach has meant that we now have this machine that is just uh, glorious to use. So the, I've got one of the first injection molded prototypes on my desk at home. Um, and that is now my main 8-bit machine as well as obviously development for the Mega 65. And it's so easy to forget that it's not the original machine. It just, as I say, except that for the ways in which it is better, um, it's just like using the original. And that was really you know, what we were aiming to, uh, uh, to achieve. Well, talking of uh, original things, um, did it need the original C65 Kickstart ROMs or uh, just ROMs? Uh, <laughs> yeah, so the, yes, um, so yes, we need the original ROMs. Um, and that also took quite a while for us to get a, um, a license arranged just because you know, the, the people involved in the process are all quite busy and, and we, we understand that. Uh, and so we actually, as a backup plan, and also just because we think it should be done and it fits in the whole open source ethos of the Mega 65, is we've actually started an open ROMs project for the C64 and C65. Uh, so Feral Child is doing the bulk of the development on that. And we've taken a very comp um, copyright defensive approach to make sure that no infringement can occur. Um, to create ROMs that are, uh, you know, compatible with the original C64 ROMs for as much software as possible and C65 ROMs as well. And if complementary to that, we have actually since negotiated a license to include the C65 ROM uh, with the finished uh, devices that we'll actually be able to ship them uh, with them. So you'd just be able to turn it on and it will just boot up to, uh, uh, to basic 10. Uh, and then we've got BitShifter and a couple of the other folks who are putting a tremendous amount of work into understanding uh, the ROMs, bug fixing them. They recreated their own assembler compatible with Commodore's original assembler for the funny way the source code was written. And, you know, the their improved uh, Mega 65 Basic 10 ROMs uh, are really lovely. Uh, they're much, much faster, even aside from the Mega 65's 40 megahertz CPU. That just megahertz for megahertz, they're much faster than the original uh, C65 ROM by using, you know, better algorithms for things, uh, much more optimized code, uh, you know, missing kind of features, commands that weren't implemented. All of these things are, you know, are being worked on. Uh, and there's a, a new release of that pretty much every week on the Discord server. But already it's actually now, I would say that the, you know, the patched ROMs are usable in, in a productive way. Whereas the Commodore ones, it was always a bit like, uh, you know, wandering around in a minefield with a blind, you know, with a, uh, a mask on uh, that, you know, it was quite easy for your program to get, uh, you know, blown up and corrupted. Uh, if you weren't paying very careful attention. Yeah, I remember trying one at the um, Centre for Computing History in Cambridge and just, you know, you try doing things that you read about and it would be like unimplemented error or something. Yeah, yeah that's right, yeah, unimplemented screen. command error was uh, one <laughs> of the it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you mentioned about the uh, three and a half inch floppy drive that's in there. Um, mm. Have you got modern storage methods on board as well? Yeah, so there's dual SD card. Uh, so there's a full size SD card in the trapdoor slot. And then there's a micro SD slot on the uh, the back of the machine. Uh, so they take SDHC cards. So you can put a 32 gig or a 64 gig uh, SD card in there uh, and it supports a fat file system. 
uh, and there's a built-in freeze cartridge in the Mega 65 hardware design as well uh, that uses a special partition on that. Uh, so you can you know you can have a couple of thousand frozen uh, games or, or software titles uh, on there, so that's quite easy to access. And then we have the 100 megabit Ethernet connector uh, on the back that, unlike the old RRNet on the C64, that was this kind of 16-bit chip, uh, you know, with its arm twisted to behave in a slightly 8-bit manner uh, and couldn't do interrupts and things, and so it was a very poor performance. Uh, the Mega 65's 100 megabit Ethernet controller you know, we've got example software that does ping times under 0.3 of a millisecond. Uh, and, you know, you can saturate the 100 megabit link uh, with this nice interrupt-driven uh, memory-mapped frame buffers. It's it's really lovely to use in comparison to the, um, uh, the RRNet uh, Ethernet. Being a FPGA, can you do something awful like uh, put an Atari core on there? Uh, yeah, so we don't have an Atari... Um, 400 or 800 core on there yet. Um, we do have an alpha spectrum core uh, that can even run some of the enhanced newer spectrum kind of uh, things. Uh, we've got a Game Boy core as well in alpha stage. Um, and there's an Amiga core in the workings as well, which I think is going to be really exciting, for, again, for the kind of the, the Commodore uh, folks to have a machine that is uh, you know able to be both the 8 and the 16-bit machine. This is a kind of you know, be that bridge, uh, the, the, you know, the Sasquatch, the missing link. Uh, between the uh, uh, the two machines and you know, let people have one machine on their desk, which I think would be really nice as well. So what what's the community reaction been like around this machine? And um, do you think like the success of other machines like the Spectrum Next have inspired confidence in the project? Um, it's been really interesting because we've purposely not taken a commercial or rushed kind of approach. So some people kind of like, oh, you've been working on this since you know 2014 or whatever. And that's it's like seven years and it's true. But I think people have seen that we've gone from strength to strength, that we now have a machine. We've sold 100 machines uh, and that the, you know, the final machines will, you know, we already have the injection molding cases and tooling and everything uh, set up, that once people see what we've created and the people who you know, kind of have that desire to, to relive that delight of the 1980s home computer experience, almost universally uh, are really enthusiastic. Uh, you know, you always get a few people grumbling around the edges. And when we've done strange things, like the way that we crowdfunded the um, uh, the injection molding tooling, uh, there were people who were kind of grumbling around the edges, but it's kind of clear, even most of the ones who are grumbling around the edges would just dearly love to have a machine. Um, they're just frustrated that they can't have one today and that maybe it won't be quite as cheap as they might like, uh, because, you know, this thing has to be uh, more expensive than a, 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 a the C64, for example, that was... You know, it's a great product made to be very affordable, whereas we've gone for something which is a, a premium product that you know you'll be able to use for the next thirty or forty years when your original sixty sixty four chips have all you know uh, given up their magic smoke. And definitely a lot cheaper than trying to get an original C sixty five. Yes, ab- absolutely, and certainly. Again, <laughs> as we say, sort of in in twenty years' time when the chips in those have all gone putt, uh, you know, it is going to be uh, the only kind of option, uh, and so. You know, and that we wanted that authentic feeling and that atmosphere. So, you know, we have the CRT emulation filter on the uh, the HDMI compatible output so that it still feels like a CRT. We have the real floppy drive that grinds and chugs even when you access the SD card so that you really get that feeling that you just are at an 8-bit machine uh, because you are. And one of those sort of little purity things as well in the Mega 65, there is no CPU other than the 8-bit CPU uh, in the Mega 65. There's no ARM CPU doing something in the background. The, you know, the SD card, everything is all controlled by the, uh, the 6502 compatible CPU in the Mega 65. So there's nothing that gets in the way of that uh, you know, pure 8-bit joy. For me, emulators are great, um, but I, my eyes are drawn to the, you know, the border of the, the host operating system around the frame. And that, for me, that spoils that uh, suspension of disbelief and I kind of go well yeah there's you know there's a, another computer going on here or with a C64 uh, you know the new ones you know they're also emulated and there's no frame but you kind of you know the menus and everything it's still there are things that feel not 8-bit about it because it's true uh, but again at the, at the price point I think they've done a really really great job and I love what they've done and it's great for the scene but for when you really want to just have a brand new 8-bit C60, you know, Commodore, new Commodore 
uh, stable kind of computer. Um, that's what we've tried to create. And I think uh, the response that we've had from everyone who's you know, touched and handled one of these machines is that that's exactly what we've created, perhaps through a measure of luck as much as, uh, uh, as trying to. Um, but we, we're just really glad that we have created uh, something that is, yeah, that just brings back the wonder. Uh, and part of that is to not recreate what was in 1991, but to recreate what your memory wants to tell you it was back in 1991. So having the faster mm. CPU and the bulk storage, uh, you know, the way that, uh, you know, uh, time makes memories grow fonder and you kind of gloss over in your memory of the, the problems with things. Uh, we've kind of erased all of those problems about the, um, uh, the C65, kept the things that make it uh, a joy and an interesting and like having your own pet unicorn at home. Uh, you know, we just rejoice in seeing, you know, the, uh, the giddy excitement of the, uh, the, the community when they get their hands on them. And I think you're right as well about the you know, emulation. Uh, using emulation on my modern machine, it's all well and good, but then when you suddenly get a Windows update pops up in front of it, it kind of does kill the illusion, doesn't it? It, it, it does, and it, it takes <laughs> a long time for that illusion to resurrect uh, because you've just mm. kind of been called out and you're not able to, if you're not using a real keyboard, uh, there's that. And even just the latency, even you know, the, the C64, they've done a great job at cutting the latency down from what it originally was. But you're still talking about, you know, uh, a few frames of latency, whereas the Mega 65 is really racing the raster beam uh, as you go along. Uh, you know, there's less than one raster line of latency on the video output. Uh, the joystick inputs and the keyboard input are of the order of 10 microseconds uh, of latency, even actually less uh, on the joystick ports, in fact. Uh, and so all of that responsiveness that was kind of, you know, a, a character of the 8-bit era uh, we still have, uh, and in fact, actually, it's even more responsive. Where are you seeing the most interest then? Is it from people that want to develop software or is it, you know, guys like me that just always wanted a <laughs> Commodore 65 on their desk? Um, so, look, I think the you always have more non-developer interest than developer interest just because of, you know, demographic statistics. Uh, but I think, as I say, with the dev kits, and okay, we, we're talking at a higher price point than what the final machine will cost, that it was about one third developers and two thirds uh, of folks who self-identified as not being developers. Uh, so I think you know that will probably still shift a bit further away from developers when we get the final machines out, partly because the most hardcore developers already now have a dev kit, and uh, you know as more software is created, it will kind of be more fun for people to um, to play with rather than to you know to necessarily need to develop things for. Uh, but you know again, our hope is. Uh, you know, like as many long-term C64 owners, they may not immediately start developing, uh, but they get to sort of, you know, to to pick that up and uh, join the fun of that uh, as and when uh, they kind of feel ready to do so. So what are the kind of most impressive, maddest things you've seen the uh, Mega 65 do so far? <laughs> Look, as I say, I, I think Shallon's um, technology demo for Turrican was fantastic. Uh, so that's that's one of my favorites. Uh, another one is one that I wrote myself, which is I wanted to do a, a Wolfenstein 3D type engine. Uh, so we have a, a kind of a uh, an engine demo that we just call Mega Maze. So it's just a, a hedge maze that you run around through. Um, but it's full screen 320 by 200 at about 10 frames a second. And we haven't really optimized it that heavily yet, but it, it's, you know, it, it works really nice uh, with that. Um, what else is there? So the, the, the mod file player is great uh, because it, it just sounds as good as an Amiga, if not a little bit better because we've actually got 16 bit uh, audio channels rather than eight bit. We've got image viewers that will view 256 color, you know, 640 by 400 uh, images and actually it's uh, partly as a joke and partly uh, as a bit of a, a proof of concept we also made slide presentation software like powerpoint for the mega 65 that actually lets you edit the slides uh, text only but with proportional fonts and different size fonts and uh, colors and things uh, and blinking text of course it's 8-bit era and so i've actually used that for a number of conference presentations uh, about the mega 65 and about uh, simple secure computing uh, and so it's always a great crowd pleaser when people kind of see you giving a presentation from on the 8-bit machine and using a, a huge clunky joystick as the uh, uh, the slide clicker and stuff. So I think they're some of my favorites. Oh, and um, uh, Mu3P's um, Solitaire for the Mega 65 just looks a delight uh, and is you know really responsive 
uh, and everything to use. And so that's at 640 by 456 color. It looks as good as the Windows Solitaire version that everyone kind of played on the on Windows 95, um, but is pure 8-bit. And it's like 28 kilobytes or something nuts uh, because it's 8-bit. So yeah, there's already kind of this variety of fun stuff. And just in the last week, we've now got a, um, a prototype Telnet BBS client so that you can connect to some of the, uh, the C64 BBSs that are out there. And that's already heaps of fun to use as well. And again, you just get that whole end-to-end uh, 8-bit experience with that. So yeah, there's, there's lots of fun stuff already and, and more is coming out uh, every month. Have you got networking built in as well? Yeah, so we, we have the 100 megabit network port. Uh, so the, uh, the Telnet uh, BBS client, uh, we've got a, a full TCP IP stack in there. So it does the DHCP discovery, it gets its IP address, and then you can choose which BBS you want to connect to uh, and makes the connection. Uh, and then has that uh, you know the uh, the terminal program uh, kind of interface. And again, that's a bit of as a as a proof of concept for being able to do much more sophisticated things with the network uh, down the track. Well, I mean, you've got these incredible capabilities in there. It does feel a, a bit like a waste of the machine's potential. But <laughs> if someone wanted to boot, you know, international karate, the C sixty four version up on the Mega sixty five, is it compatible with sixty four software? So IK plus, I can't remember whether it is at the moment. So lots of things work. In fact, lots of cartridges even work already, but not all of them. But again, on the C65, not everything was compatible either. But the the hardware doesn't need any changes for that to improve. That's just a case of working on the VHDL code for the FPGA as we go along. And so we're kind of doing that along with other sort of critical par things to get the, um, uh, the machine out. So I'm not expecting that we'll have 100% compatibility with every game title um, on day one but it will be quite good already, better than the C65 ever had, which had some quite major compatibility problems, in fact, um, and that it will get better over time. And again, being open source, um, we don't necessarily have to be the ones working on those compatibility improvements. We, we will, but the community has the confidence that they can actually you know, patch things and improve things as they go along uh, as well. Well, what's the documentation going to be like? Yeah, so the, the documentation we've already got is about a 900-page manual um, that we've done very much in the same typesetting style as the original C64 programmer's reference guide. Because uh, again, to me, part of that joy of discovery of an 8-bit machine is to sit there with this huge ring-bound book uh, and flip through and go like, oh, I wonder what I could do with that register or that feature, or you know, let's see how I can you know, play sound in BASIC uh, and those sorts of things. So there's already a huge section documenting all the commands in BASIC 10 and sort of some you know, intro programming to BASIC stuff in there. There's a beautiful machine setup thing with nice diagrams about where to plug everything. Uh, the chipset reference is something like 300 pages uh, already as well. Um, and again, there's a, a bunch of examples on how to do different things uh, uh, with the, the video controller, with the sound, uh, with the DMA controller. Yeah, and, and that's continuing to grow. And again, there's a bunch of folks in the community all contribute uh, to that because that's all open source as well. And so we hope to actually produce printed versions of that that people can buy uh, and have those volumes on their desk. Probably it will end up being five volumes of about 300 pages each is my gut feeling uh, because ring, bounding, ring binding a 1,000 plus page book is um, uh, logistically difficult, shall we say. I mean, having been involved in this project, Paul, for you know six years, you've been working on this. Um, what have kind of been the, the biggest challenges then and you know, any, any things that you didn't expect along the way that you ran into? Look, I think VHDL programming, I often joke with the, uh, the German uh, team members, is you know, like you know, going for a, a Sunday picnic in Mordor only you know, with more smoke and fire. Uh, in that you know, there, <laughs> there are things that seem they should be really easy and turn out to be really hard, and yet other things that you think are going to be showstoppers sometimes turn out to be really quick and easy to fix. Uh, and so there's kind of that aspect to it. And there is an element of cat herding where you're trying to get all of these things together to work stably and reliably together. Uh, and that's, you know, if you like the systems integration and testing piece can be quite hard work. But I think what's been really great is that wherever we've had a great challenge with these things, uh, you know, the community has kind of, you know, produced people who've volunteered to help with things uh, and to break those kind of, uh, you know, uh, lock points, particularly at times when, you know, myself or others as volunteers haven't had as much time to be able to, to put into the machine. And so, uh, you know, it has continued to, uh, you know, to progress in leaps and bounds. And, you know, I think we're still hoping that either, well, I think we're still aiming that by the end of this year, the pre-orders will be open for the final machine. And you know, again, because of COVID, we actually hope to have the machines out this year. That I think is looking uncertain at the moment, but hopefully next year 
people will actually have machines, you know, w- very much uh, before Christmas, um, maybe even before summer. Uh, we'll see, but we, we don't want to make any promises uh, because you know there are so many factors outside of our control, and as a, a bunch of volunteers, um, you know, it's just that it's hard to predict uh, what the forward path uh, you know will be. Well, your day job is uh, being a computer science lecturer. Um, have you hmm. had any interest from the students? Yeah, so the students uh, love it, and so we've actually we've run a, a few projects on it where students have worked on different aspects of it, and that includes. Uh, working on the PCB design for a handheld version of the Mega 65 that would double as a mobile phone. And this is sort of one of my favourite little pet side projects of that to make uh, an 8-bit smartphone uh, that actually can be much more secure and privacy respecting um, and just a darn lot of fun. The students, I think, enjoy kind of the retro aspect of it as well as that it's an architecture that they can understand. Uh, So I also use it to teach the operating systems course. So instead of showing them how to do a, you know, uh, to move from user space to kernel space on an x86, where you've got hundreds of lines of assembly language, um, it's two instructions on the Mega 65 to uh, transition into the hypervisor, the 8-bit hypervisor that the Mega 65 uh, implements. Well, Paul, before we spoke, I already desperately wanted a Mega 65. You've just increased (laughs) my appetite for it over the last hour or so. Um, I know you mentioned that, you know, hopefully... By this time next year, you know, the pre-orders are going to be available. Any idea what kind of the final cost roughly is going to be? Yes, yeah, so, so this is always the, the, the million dollar question, right? Uh, you know, how much will it cost and when will it be available? And our answers mm. to both of those are as cheap as possible and as soon as possible, recognising <laughs> that we're a bunch of volunteers working on this stuff. So, you know, the, the price will be somewhere, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, sorry, it will be substantially less than the thousand euros, um, exactly how low we can get it is, as I say, open to, uh, you know, factors beyond our control at the moment to get every last price pinned down. And as I say, you know, the the final hardware we're hoping to have available for order by the end of this year. But people who are keen to get involved in the meantime uh, can actually buy off-the-shelf commercial FPGA development boards that are compatible with the Mega 65 that was originally developed on, in fact, and get involved that way. And if you don't want to have to spend on them, um, if you go to um, Shallon 50k on Twitch, where he, he does the streams on uh, on uh, C64 and Game Boy programming, he's got a monthly giveaway where they're giving away at least one of these FPGA boards every month for this entire year. So a number of people have already got themselves free Mega 65 compatible hardware to start getting involved uh, and you know uh, being part of the journey, because again, it's the journey of exploring the machine of seeing what can be done of being the people you know a bit like with nasa today with mars right uh they've just you know Mm. flown a helicopter an aircraft uh, powered flight on another world for the first time and so you know you can be the the first person to figure out how to to do new effects on the mega 65 or to even just make uh, relatively simple things that people haven't implemented for the mega 65 yet so there's a very much a you know there's that joy of trailblazing uh that can be experienced today so you know folks who have an interest and whether that's in testing software or whether it's in you know developing software or contributing to documentation or hardware design, any of those things, uh, you know, my strong advice as someone who's really enjoyed working on the Mega sixty five for the past you know six or seven years is you know don't put off getting involved in the fun because it really is uh, the, I think the, the most fun project that I've been involved in, uh, and it's clear that there are many many more years of uh, of great fun for everyone that wants to get involved. Uh, to you know, to enjoy. Well, Paul, I'll obviously put a link to um, the website and your communities in our show notes as well. Everyone should go and check it out and um, follow your progress as well. Like I said, I think you know, for me, this is you know one of the most exciting projects in retro computing that I've heard of in years, and you know, I'm so hyped to get my hands on one when I when I finally can. And um, thank you so much for coming on and uh, sharing some new stories. And the best of luck with it. Thank you very much, and thanks for having me. 